I like to call up the next panel, which my colleague Jacob Kierkegaard will be chairing. Um, the next panel is going to be about the European financial system today on the eve of the launch of the single supervisory <coughs> mechanism. Now everyone has a PowerPoint which means that um, I think everyone will be able to see uh, uh, even though we already sit up here. So that is good and I'm happy to say that uh, we have an absolutely stellar panel to discuss uh, this issue. Um, because the first panelist is Katharina Eckhorn, uh, who will be probably known to most of you as the now former deputy governor of the Riksdags in Sweden, but uh, has recently uh, joined the new government as state secretary uh, in the Ministry of Finance. And before that, before joining the Riksdag, also had a distinguished career in Swedish academia, indeed European and international academia. In the middle, we have uh, Michael Foley, who is the managing director for Moody's Global Financial Institutions practice. Uh, but for this particular purpose, it is also uh, incredibly relevant to note that Michael has uh, a distinguished career as a banking supervisor with the Federal Reserve, uh, <coughs> where he was the senior associate director responsible for large banking supervision during the uh, financial crisis and only uh, returned to Moody's in 2012. And then finally, uh, we have Ajay Chopra, uh, who is now fortunately with us here at the Peterson Institute, but was, of course, the former deputy director of the IMF's European department, and at least in this building, is universally credited with single-handedly rescuing the Irish economy. Um, each panelist has about 10 minutes uh, for their presentation, and I believe everyone has a PowerPoint. So. Oh, okay, only two PowerPoints, even better. But Katerina, without further ado, I think it's probably easier if we, if you stay up there, and we should. Yes, that is. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you so much for the inv invitation. And um, because I switched job <laughs> very recently, there's been a flurry of activities the last, um, cup, last uh, day or so to remove all the uh, logos of the Swedish Central Bank from my slides and, uh, <laughs> and also um, making sure that I don't preempt uh, any uh, position that the new Swedish government may want to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the European Banking Union. Uh, so, and as, as was clear here, uh, we, we do have a new government and uh, I, I think they haven't really uh, put down their um, foot yet regarding where they want to stand uh, in, in terms of the membership in the banking union. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, stand here and uh, uh, make some uh, stark revelation regarding what the Swedish position is likely to be. Uh, but I can give you some, um, some more general views on uh, the plans for a, a European banking union from a non-Euro country perspective. And my starting point is very much uh, where uh, Marco Butti's presentation or the, uh, uh, the focus on, of uh, Marco Butti's presentation, namely that there, there isn't really um, any sign of a clear recovery in the Euro area if we look at uh, more the general um, economic development. So my graph here shows uh, GDP in levels and it, it's indexed so it takes uh, the value 100 um, last quarter of 2007 before the financial crisis. So the red curve is the euro area and it's, it has been pretty flat the last few years. Of course there are um, uh, differences within the euro area, so I've also uh, put Germany in this uh, graph. Uh, and Germany has of course done much better than the crisis country in the European periphery. 
Uh, but still, even Germany is show, showing signs of, of weaknesses more recently. And of course, there are many different reasons why uh, the development uh, has been so weak. But I would um, think that one um, factor, at least, important factor, has, is uh, remaining uh, weaknesses in the European banking sector. And of course, in Europe, um, bank, banks are very important for um, uh, credit intermediation, much more important than here in the United States. So this uh, um, <coughs> diagram shows, well, the, the blue bars shows um, uh, quarter one capital ratios. It's the medium for, uh, for a large number of banks that are going to fall under uh, ECB supervision. So on the positive side, you see that there's been uh, sort of an increased um, uh, capital ratios in these banks and that is partly uh, related to the banks having uh, taken in more capital but of course also partly related to some um, uh, process where they, they have shedded assets. Now the, the red bars show you profitability in terms of return on equity and uh, there the development is of course not so positive uh, very weak profitability and uh, declining profitability. And uh, to a large extent, uh, the decline in profitability is related to poorly performing assets in these banks. And there's a lot of uncertainty uh, regarding the European banking <coughs> sector also uh, when it comes to where exactly these poorly uh, performing assets are located. And I think one important um, aspect of uh, the process leading up to uh, the creation of uh, a single supervisory mechanism um, located at the European Central Bank is the fact that all of this has to go, you have to go through uh, the banks now. So there has been uh, this exercise, the comprehensive assessment going through the quality of assets in the European banks uh, carrying out a, a, a stress test. And I, I see this as, a, as an opportunity to restore uh, confidence in the European banking sector. Of course, there's been a number of stress tests carried out before, but I think unlike the, the ones uh, or the, the main one in the US, uh, they weren't really perceived as very uh, credible. But this time, the ECB has very strong incentives to really find the weaknesses, where the weaknesses are, and to deal with them, because they don't really want to take over supervision uh, over banks that aren't really viable, even at the outset. And as I've noted on this slide, um, at least according to a survey made by Goldman Sachs, there is the perception in the market is that um, this exercise is, is likely to be credible. But it remains to be seen. We will, uh, we will see very shortly since the results are going to be presented uh, at the end of this month. Now from a Swedish perspective, um, I would say that uh, the, the characteristics of the Swedish financial sector is such that uh, there are um, large uh, or sort of membership in a banking union uh, may be uh, quite beneficial so this diagram shows you um, bank assets in relation to GDP. And here it's uh, bank group, so it, it also includes assets held by um, foreign su subsidiaries. So you see that Sweden has very large banks in relation to the size of the economy. And a lot of it is related to operations outside Sweden. Uh, but because of this very large financial sector and the fact that a lot of these activities are in Europe, in, in the Euro area. Um, I think the, in principle, uh, uh, Sweden is one of those countries that could uh, have a lot to benefit from um, an, an integrated um, a regulatory uh, framework for, for the banks. But the way uh, the banking union is being constructed creates some political obstacles to membership for a non-euro uh, country. 
Um, so one obstacle is that because the single supervisory mechanism is located at the ECB, um, uh, non-euro countries don't have uh, a seat at the table where the formal decisions are being taken, which is the governing council of the ECB. So that's one issue. Uh, another one that I've noted on this slide is that um, it's a little bit unclear. So there's a single resolution fund that are, is going to be built up by uh, taking in fees from the banks, but it's, um, it, it uh, remains a little bit uh, unclear whether uh, this fund is going to be sufficient uh, to uh, provide proper insurance for a country such as Sweden with our large banks. So those are some of the obstacles. Uh, and the, the outgoing government, uh, the previous government, um, uh, because of these obstacles, uh, has sort of chose to take a, a wait and see approach uh, to the issue of membership. Still, it's going to be the case that Swedish banks will fall under um, supervision by the ECB um, because of their operations outside Sweden, uh, because there are these criteria based on uh, size of assets or whether there is the most uh, important banks in, in, in uh, uh, membership countries. So uh, three out of our four large banks are going to uh, be under SM, SSM supervision um, in one way or another. So that's a challenge uh, for uh, a country that uh, will remain uh, outside the SSM, at, or at least at, at the outset. Now another, um, uh, I think, um, issue is that the way um, bank resolution is being set up uh, seems extremely complicated. So there's a picture here that you probably won't see the details of and it's not meant to be. It's, uh, you may have seen it in other contexts. It's something that a, a German politician who is a member of the European Parliament made in order to try to illustrate uh, how resolution is supposed to work, all the steps involved and all the different parties involved in trying to resolve or restructure uh, a bank with problems. And uh, it's actually said somewhere in this picture uh, something about, and this is, going, is supposed to be done over a weekend, seriously, question mark. Uh, and also, if you have very large banks like we have, lots of foreign activities, cross-border activities, this is also a, 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 a source of concern. Is this really going to work in terms of resolution? And finally, um, I would say that it also, um, as you probably know, uh, a, a, an important part of um, the framework for uh, resolution and restructuring is that there is going to be bail-in. Uh, of creditors and I think there's a fear in, in Sweden that a bail-in uh, would involve large uh, contagion risks and this uh, pie chart shows you uh, the asset share of uh, our large banks uh, and so the, the colors except the green one is the four large banks and so you see that our four la large banks hold uh, more than 75% of banking assets in Sweden. So there is a concern that if one of these uh, banks if, uh, get into problems and there's bail-in of creditors, given that these banks are, they look quite similar, they have quite similar exposures, that this is going to uh, lead to terrible uh, contagion um, processes that uh, makes uh, all the banks uh, for, uh, End into uh, end in, in in problems, so I think all of these are uh, concerns um, that has uh, made the previous government to want to wait and see a little bit. So, in short, strong banks are needed for econ economic recovery in Europe. The uh, as the uh, the assess comprehensive assessment uh, with a credible asset quality review is a precondition for regained confidence, I would say. And although the benefits from, from participating in a banking union is likely to be high in the Swedish case, um, 
it seems likely that we will stay outside uh, for the time being. Uh, we will still be affected because our banks will fall under the supervision uh, of, of uh, the ECB. And we think that bail-in can be a, a challenge and we're pretty sure that resolution will be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Michael? So I think I have a deck. Oh, excellent. Um, I'm going to start just by referring back to the title of the session today, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, Challenge and Poised for Change. Uh, I've been involved uh, as a bank analyst or a supervisor in the banking sector for some 25 years. And I've had the, uh, I guess, pleasure of, of uh, living through the Texas bank crisis, New England real estate, the SNL crisis, uh, a number of emerging market crises and some pretty spectacular one-off bank failures. Uh, but I don't think anything has approached the stress that we've seen in the banking system over the last several years post Lehman. And, and when I think about the AQR and the, and the comprehensive stress test underway, underway right now, or even the CCAR, compared to what the banks have actually had to go through in terms of a real-life stress test, um, you know, it just kind of pales by comparison. Uh, but having thought about the changes that have come out of prior you know, crises, having thought about the fact that uh, too big to fail has been on the agenda uh, many times in the past, but there's been very little progress towards actually ending it. I think we truly have seen more fundamental, more profound, more long-lasting change coming out of this crisis uh, by far than any prior crisis we've been through. And I think that that's true in, in terms of a, a significant limitation on activities that banks can get, engage in. Uh, regulatory requirements and standards around liquidity and capital that are going to be embedded and, and I think long-lasting. I think a fundamental uh, step change in terms of requirements from a regulatory standpoint and around internal risk management that again I, I think is going to be long-lasting and perhaps most importantly around resolution. Um, we're recovering resolution. We've gone beyond talking about it. Uh, there's political will at this point uh, and most importantly there are legislative frameworks that are being put in place. So just to give you, you know, a sense of the, uh, the magnitude of the change, and I'll speak in rating space, I'm most comfortable with that. Um, prior to Lehman, the average rating in North America for banks was AA2. This was a very highly rated industry. Uh, the average rating in Europe was also AA2. Uh, today, uh, the average bank rating in North America has come down to A1, so that's a two-notch differential, which over this amount of time from a historical standard is a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant move. In Europe, in the non-euro area banks, uh, the average is now A2, so a three-notch move. And in the euro area, the average rating is now BAA1, five notches lower than we were prior to Lehman. So there's been a, a fairly significant structural change in terms of how I think the market, how the rating agencies view banks, and again, I don't think that's a, a short-term phenomenon. If we were here having this discussion two years ago, I think we would have been talking about acute stress in the banking system. Uh, even a year ago, we were you know, very focused, um, not so much on core Europe at that point, but on a number of the banking systems in the periphery, uh, systems that had either gone through recapitalization, uh, were in the process of going through recapitalization, or were threatened with recapitalization. Now, I, I think as we stand here today, uh, much of the tail risk that we had focused on has been reduced. Um, and many of the banking systems have, at least from a financial strength standpoint, uh, stabilized. I, I think that's been obvious in the core European banking systems, but increasingly I think it's, it's evident in some of the peripheral countries as well. Um, for example, from a sovereign standpoint, we've upgraded the ratings of a number of peripheral countries. Um, while growth has not been robust, robust we've moved from in many of these countries, a significant uh, recession, in some cases, such as Italy, a triple dip recession, to at least a point where we're seeing stability and the potential for growth in the near term. Asset quality, liquidity across the board is much stronger. Funding issues that were a real threat to the banking system have receded pretty dramatically with the help of the ECB. Asset quality is the one area uh, where we continue to see a significant overhang. 
but the difference there is quite stark between the core European countries and many of the peripheral countries, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, having said that, I think one of the biggest challenges that the banks are facing going forward uh, is growth, uh, and the lack of growth or the, the very modest growth. And we've seen, I think, through the first, you know, second quarter essentially flat growth this year, expectations in Europe for about 1% growth, and that significantly raises the degree of difficulty for banks that will have to work through a very significant overhang of problem assets over the coming years. Uh, and, and compounding that because of the low rate environment, while there's some benefits from that in terms of borrowers' capability to repay, um, some benefits from a funding cost standpoint, margins have been continually squeezed. Profitability is quite thin, so the ability of banks to deal with uh, ongoing credit costs has been, uh, again, uh, fairly challenged. This just pictorially shows some of the progression uh, in Moody's ratings. Um, the green portion of the bars are, are the, the uh, elements of the rating that are effectively the standalone financial strength. You'll see that uh, since 2008 to today, the significant change in our ratings has been primarily driven by financial strength. Um, and across most of Europe today, we have stable outlooks on banks in terms of financial strength. There are some exceptions. Italy is one exception where two-thirds of our banks still have negative outlooks uh, in terms of their underlying financial strength. But for the most part, um, our view has, has stabilized uh, in many of these systems. The yellow bar is the area that we're focused on right now. And that's the portion of the rating that's attributed to systemic support. Um, and there have been a number of changes that have come out of this crisis. I think potentially the most significant, the most long-lasting is around uh, the movement to actually end too big to fail. And as I mentioned before, while there's been discussion around this, what we now have is very specific legislation in the U.S. around Dodd-Frank, very specific legislation that will come into force in Europe uh, in terms of the BRD, uh, and a political will uh, to put in place a framework where there will be much less flexibility going forward for receivers, for regulators, uh, to support banks, even if they think it would be appropriate to do, for, do so from a financial stability or a contagion risk standpoint. Um, as it stands today, um, the yellow bars are still quite large for senior unsecured debt. Support for subordinated ratings for hybrids has essentially disappeared over the last uh, three to four years. Uh, but we are having to go back and look at the support that's embedded in our European ratings. Two-thirds of European banks still have some systemic support built in for senior unsecured debt. Uh, it equals three notches, the equivalent of three notches, which is very material in core Europe and a little over one notch in peripheral Europe. So that is a key focus for us going forward. Uh, I'll speak to some of the underlying fundamentals, and I'll, I'll be relatively brief here, um, just referring to some of the trends where there is you know, unambiguous progress. Uh, the numbers here, I think, are, are you know, self-evident and pretty compelling. Uh, tangible common equity to risk-weighted assets increasing from just over 7% to close to 13%. Um, problem loans relative to equity plus loan loss reserves that have been quite stable for most of the core European banking systems and actually improving in a number of those systems, including the UK. Um, quite a bit of a, a dichotomy with the peripheral um, European countries here, though, as you can see, um, that uh, problem loans have been increasing at a pace that has outstripped their ability to reserve for those loans to generate capital to offset potential losses. We have seen a flattening of that in a number of systems in 2014. So we may be seeing a bit of a inflection point for some systems. There are other systems, Italy being one, for example, Cyprus being a more extreme example, where you continue to see significant inflow, inflow of new non-performers that aren't being uh, offset by reserves or capital. It, it's worth just noting for a moment liquidity in funding because uh, as we went through the crisis, this was the most significant factor in determining whether banks were viable or not viable. Uh, and today, we're in a, a, a dramatically different situation. The European banks are far less reliant on market funding. They have much stronger liquidity. Uh, even in the periphery, uh, the banks have deleveraged. Uh, they've improved their deposit funding. The ECB has gone you know, a long way towards addressing the near-term pressures. So uh, this was a key driver of our rating considerations two years ago, three years ago. It's, it's basically come off the table as a concern. Uh, certainly, that can reverse going forward. 
to some extent, you know, we view the regulatory enhancements around the LCR, the NSFR, as being uh, helpful in, in, you know, making sure that the banks continue to have a, a more conservative approach to liquidity and funding. Uh, I'll spend just a minute on profitability because from a credit standpoint, uh, this is perhaps the issue that we're most focused on uh, over the medium to long term. Uh, and, you know, what, what we have seen is that, you know, certainly the market does not expect banks to earn the type of returns that they earned pre-crisis. Uh, many banks have readjusted their expectations and communicated lower ROE targets to the market. Um, but the fact is that many banks still are not earning their current cost of capital. Uh, that's a situation that can persist for some period of time, but the longer that goes on, the more pressures that will pose uh, for the management. So they've taken a number of steps in Europe. They've taken these steps in the U.S. as well in terms of, you know, focusing on core businesses, exiting geographies and lines of business uh, where earnings were weaker, where risks were higher. Uh, but they're also having to deal with higher costs, uh, higher costs for compliance, uh, litigation and fines. Um, and those are going to be, uh, I think, persistent costs going forward. So the concerns we have around this is behavior going forward for the banks. And that's kind of highlighted a bit in, in the red box here. Um, and, you know, historically, uh, if you go back through prior banking cycles, that, you know, I think the suggestion is bankers have the shortest memory uh, on record. Uh, but there is a tendency if banks are unable to earn an appropriate return to look for revenue growth. And banks are very frustrated today. I think they believe they have enough capacity, funding, access to liquidity to book quality loans. There's intense competition, including in the peripheral countries, for bankable credits. Spreads are relatively tight, uh, given the economic conditions overall. Um, but banks are still finding it quite difficult to generate revenue growth, as they're seeing runoff in a very large non-performing portfolio. Uh, so there have been, you know, a number of efforts to reduce costs and take other steps, uh, but as it stands right now, perhaps the, the biggest challenge is, is growth going forward. And, and the chart here, I think, is just a, a little bit longer time horizon, but similar to what we've seen already today. And, and clearly, you know, in prior cycles, the recovery has been stronger, it's been more pronounced, it's been more sustained. Um, and in Europe in particular, what we've seen is a fairly modest bump up and then a trickle down in terms of economic growth and uncertainty in terms of the direction going forward. And I'll just compare that to the U.S. a bit where, as was noted today, the recovery in the U.S. has not been as robust as might have been the case given the severity of the downturn, but there has now been enough growth uh, for a long enough period and that's sustained and the expectation of, of sustained growth has been sufficient enough to allow for uh, underlying uh, asset prices to, to firm up for banks to understand what the likely loss content is. Um, and, and from a reserve standpoint, um, that's been evident in, in credit costs that are now more in line with what we would have seen uh, pre-crisis uh, than at any point since. So uh, the longer that uh, that growth factor is, I guess, an overhang in, in European banks, the more likely that instead of this being a one, two, three year time horizon in terms of working through problems, it becomes a, a much longer, much more protracted uh, problem. So I, I think I'll leave it with that. Um, if we have time for questions, it might come, be interesting to come back and talk about resolution as well. Um, but uh, uh, let's move on. Thank you very much, Michael. Ajay? Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished company. At the outset, I also I, I just want to do a shout out to Nicholas Viron, who's a colleague here at Peterson. He's the resident expert on banking issues, especially on Europe, and I've benefited greatly from discussions with him and his writings. Uh, but the views here are are my own, not 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 to be ascribed to him. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll first touch very briefly on uh, how I see the problems in the banking system in the Eurozone, and I'll focus primarily on the Eurozone, not the EU. And then I'm going to discuss uh, three aspects of how these problems are being addressed, the AQR, the uh, move towards banking union, 
Uh, but one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I do want to touch on is the importance of repairing private sector uh, balance sheets. Now, these are, of course, vast topics. I know I stand between you and lunch, so I'll sort of be uh, quite selective in, in what I cover. I think on the problems, the previous speakers and also Marco Buti uh, have touched on, on them. Uh, uh, but just, just to recap a couple of, uh, couple of points and, and add a couple. I mean, first, uh, banks in the euro area have been very slow in dealing with uh, uh, unviable banks, except in the most egregious cases. Uh, we've also heard uh, about investor uncertainty, about the true condition of banks. Uh, we've already heard about uh, a very weak income and profitability of these banks. Uh, which is, of course, also then constraining their ability to supply credit. Uh, so we're seeing growth of lending to the private sector being in negative territory. Yes, there is a demand element, uh, but there's a very substantial supply element over here too. And uh, the GFSR uh, from the IMF that got released yesterday has some very nice analysis on this. Uh, second, uh, financial markets are still fragmented. Marco Buti had a nice slide on that, so I don't have to go into the specific issues over there. Uh, the third point problem that I'd highlight is that uh, sovereign and bank links remain very tight. Uh, home bias of, uh, in sovereign debt portfolios held by banks is still quite significant, and if anything, it might have increased. Uh, the fourth issue is uh, that there's still a very significant corporate and household debt overhang, which is the counterpart of what's, what's happening in the banks. And then Michael Foley just, uh, just also emphasized the macroeconomic risks. Banks don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in a particular macroeconomic environment. And the macroeconomic environment that they face is one of low inflation, very weak growth, and very high public and private debt. Now, having pointed to these problems, I think it's also important to point out that the market environment is benign, and that this is also something that uh, Michael Foley mentioned. So the systemic threats uh, have receded, spreads have tightened, uh, bank funding conditions have improved, but I think history also does tell us that markets can overshoot uh, fundamentals. So how are these, these problems being addressed? I think there's already been uh, 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 sev uh, several mentions of the AQR. Uh, and I think you know, when these results are announced in a few weeks, uh, uh, the press and analysts will, will try to instantly come up with a verdict on whether they're successful or credible. And they'll end up focusing on the aggregate uh, capital requirement, uh, in my view. That's not the way to look at this, and the truth is going to be uh, is that it's going to be take, take quite some time before we can judge, because success of this exercise will depend very much on the rigor of a bank repair uh, rather than just having a big ca uh, capital hole. Uh, I think uh, 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 Ms. Ekholm already talked about the uh, the reputational issues for the ECB and their incentives. But, you know, I fear that there could also be a tendency for forbearance in order to avoid any uh, market instability right now, especially given that there isn't a common euro area backstop uh, to protect market confidence. And it's also possible that because of just inexperience uh, that the ECB will miss some material asset quality problems in, in, in the process of this exercise. They still have to rely on na uh, captured uh, national supervisors. But you know there have been positive developments. I mean, uh, a lot of focus has been on the fact that uh, banks have uh, been raising capital. They have been recognizing bad loans. But I think there's what been very recently there was one other uh, event that happened that uh, uh, that uh, has been less noticed. Uh, there is uh, an Austrian bank, uh, Austria Volksbank, that's already started the wind down process. I mean, essentially. Uh, it was clear that this bank would not pass the stress test. Uh, it had been bailed out in the past by the Austrian government. The Austrian government decided it's not going to put any more capital into this bank. So it, the wind down process has started ahead of the AQR and stress test results. I would hope that we'd see more of these, uh, but you know, l l let's see. If we, if we did see more of these, uh, I think that would be quite a significant development. 
In a blog post uh, uh, a few months ago, Nicholas Viron and I used the catchy phrase that what, uh, what uh, Europe needs to do as a part of this exercise is kill the zombies and heal the wounded. And here the zombies here are zombie banks and the wounded here are wounded banks. Uh, so, uh, so the basic point is to, to maximize uh, prospects for success of the AQR, uh, it will be essential to identify the banks uh, that are not viable and that should be closed in an orderly manner uh, and, uh, and those that uh, can be made viable with corrective measures. Just a few words on the bail-in regime. I think this, is, this has been mentioned. My, my view is that bail-in of unsecured senior uh, bonds to reduce the cost of resolving un, uh, uh, zombie banks would be the right thing to do. It would, uh, it would, it would reduce the, the resolution cost. It would increase financial discipline. Uh, it would reduce moral hazard. Now, having said that, I don't think it's, this is going to happen in this exercise. The, the BRRD uh, does not come into full effect until 2016, and the ECB, I think, will be reluctant to do anything uh, that might cause uh, tension in bank funding markets. Rather, I do think we, we will see write-down of shareholder equity, as well as hybrid instruments, subordinated debt, uh, as happened in the case of Banco Espirito Santo. Now, I, I very much take the point that there is a danger of conta contagion if, uh, if, uh, uh, if senior uh, debt is written down. But the point I'd make over here is that it would be quite unfortunate, I think, if protecting senior debt markets in the Eurozone uh, comes at the expense of uh, putting the burden on taxpayers in an individual country as well. Uh, two quick additional aspects on these stress tests. One is they don't include a deflation shock. Uh, uh, even in countries where the risk of deflation is, 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 is particularly high. So uh, weak, weak assumptions about stress tests is going to make it uh, uh, more difficult for the ECB to establish trust uh, that the banks are sound. Uh, the second, uh, a second problem that I see is uh, that the concerns, uh, you know, the, the, the genuine concerns about risk weighting uh, and also about the definition of capital in, in, in the euro area, uh, in the EU actually. Uh, and I think uh, you know, studies do show that uh, risk-based tier one capital are not a good predictor of default, uh, while simple unweighted uh, leverage ratios are much better. Uh, now, one good thing is that the disclosure as a part of the stress test, will include a, a, a leverage ratio. But I think it would be much better if this leverage ratio was not just based on CET1, but rather was based on tangible common equity, which then takes out uh, goodwill, it takes out deferred tax credits, uh, it takes out minority interests, because this is what really has the loss absorbency. Now, on, on banking union. Look, my bottom line is that what's been achieved since the launch of Banking Union uh, uh, in the middle of 2012, so two years ago, has been very important and in some respects even quite radical. It's a big change in the institutional structure, but I think it's a misnomer to call it a banking union as yet because it does not break this vicious circle between uh, banks and sovereigns. The most concrete improvement is the launch of the SSM, the Single Supervisory Mechanism, because a key benefit of the SSM is that it will increase the fungibility of liquidity within cross-border groups, which will help uh, reduce financial fragmentation. But some of the other elements, the single resolution mechanism, it's already been pointed out as to how cumbersome that is. Uh, but also, it's not really a, a, a single resolution uh, mechanism because it's still subject to national uh, resolution authorities and uh, who have divergent res resolution regimes. So, uh, you know, I would question the, the notion as to whether it really is single. And also the single resolution fund uh, ha will have very limited capacity and it'll take a long time to build. On direct bank recap, there has been political agreement to have such an instrument, but I think the uh, likelihood of being it being used are very low because uh, the conditions that have been applied are very, very stringent. Uh, so, you know, I don't see that as, 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 as a real instrument as yet in, uh, uh, for, for the euro area. 
But more fundamentally, uh, deposit insurance will remain a national, uh, will remain purely national in the absence of any move to a fiscal union or uh, move towards U uh, euro bonds. So there's no common fiscal backstop. And uh, you know what? Uh, what this ends up meaning is that you know if there is a crisis, uh, it's not clear what will happen if uh, uh, if if the SRF and 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 national deposit schemes. Uh, are insufficient to deal with it. This also ends up raising some, some, some anomalies because, you know, uh, what we, as far as I can tell, the provision of emergency liquidity assistance is still going to be based on national central banks. Rather than, you know, once you have the SSM, it would have been logical that all lender of last resort would move to the ECB, but as far as I can tell, that, that's, that's not going to happen. So the result is, that banks and sovereigns uh, uh, remain joined at the hip, and uh, you know, as long as banks are not independent uh, of their domicile and of their sovereign, uh, banking markets will not be fully integrated. Uh, last point is on repairing uh, uh, private sector balance sheets. Uh, it's all very well to recapitalize banks, but this on its own will not get investment and credit flowing because repair of, of these stretched private balance sheets is also essential. And I think we saw this in, in, in Ireland in spades where you know, the banks did get recapitalized in 2011, but it took two years to get in uh, uh, schemes to be able to deal with very large mortgage arrears. Uh, so I, you know, uh, I, I would stress that dealing with the corporate and household debt overhang uh, is going to be a very important element of what needs to be done. Now, of course, repairing private bank balance sheets uh, uh, is going to be much easier uh, if inflation was at target uh, and preferably even above target, but I don't see that as something that's in prospect in, in the Eurozone. Uh, so this means that the emphasis ends up being uh, on you know, getting the institutional framework right uh, you know, uh, national insolvency regimes, uh, out-of-court settlements, uh, creditor coordination, liquidation procedures, etc. And of course, it's going to be important that firms in the future rely much more on equity. And this then comes back to the point that's been touched on about a single capital market, the capital market union. And it's not just firms that should rely more on equity. Of course, banks should also rely much more on equity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ajay. Um, I thought, that since I always believe that there is a risk that, that any discussion that relates to the European financial system, and especially the SSM, is, is really uh, at the risk of getting bogged down in a lot, lot of details, I thought I would use my prerogative as chair to ask the first question, which is really a very broad and ultimately, I guess, political question. Because one of the most striking things about uh, the banking union and the SSM in general has always seems to me to be this uh, remarkably audacious step that the Europeans are now uh, engaging in, which is really taking away control, day-to-day -day control over large banks away from national governments, which is, you know, essentially a step that, at least to my knowledge, hasn't been attempted uh, by at least liberal uh, market economy, liberal democracies, market economies before. Uh, if you at least if you ignore those who have essentially a foreign-owned uh, banking sector, and at the same time, I mean, I think uh, Carolina, you mentioned that at least the previous Swedish government has had some you know, significant reservations about this issue. Uh, I think it's fair to say, Michael, that in the U.S., uh, such a uh, handover of national control over national banks would be impossible. But then on the other hand, Ajay, uh, since you were involved in Ireland, it's fair to say that this was perhaps a case where loss of control over the national banking system by the national government should have <laughs> proceeded a little quicker. Um, so how, how do you see this? Uh, can this work? And uh, uh, what are some of the potential pitfalls? It's open for anyone in the panel who wishes to ask. Well, maybe I should just start to say something. And uh, you know, I think in I've, I've thought even long before the financial crisis that it uh, would be a good idea to have a unified regulatory framework uh, 
for the financial sector in Europe as part of European integration. And actually, many years ago, I participated in writing a report about the Baltic, um, Nordic Baltic region, where we proposed that maybe that particular region could go ahead and try to create a more maybe not a, a fully fledged banking union, but with integrated supervision. Um, that wasn't very well received at the time, I remember, and the report is buried somewhere in someone's drawer or burnt, I don't know. Uh, but I think in principle, it, it's uh, uh, um, this idea of having completely integrated financial markets and completely na uh, fragmented uh, supervision and regulation um, it doesn't, uh, f those things don't fit well together. Uh, but then, of course, the, the momentum uh, to do this comes from the crisis, so the euro crisis, so that's clear. But uh, so has many European, many reforms that have sort of pushed European integration further has come from crisis, is very often pointed out. And uh, well, I think this is an example of this. I guess as a former supervisor, I'd be the first to admit that supervision is not the solution to all of our problems, um, and uh, there's only so much that, that can be done. But I, I think, you know, as we move towards a world where uh, there's going to be resolution, where there's going to be bail-in on, on a more routine basis, and we want to uh, avoid market contagion and spillover effects from that, it's going to be important for investors to be able to make their own assessment and a reasonable assessment of risk amongst firms and position correctly and price correctly for that risk. And I think one of the real challenges uh, we've had as credit analysts at, at Moody's, and I'm sure others have had as well, is it's trying to, to really understand the depth of the issues, the depth of the problems as we've been looking at balance sheets over the last several years. And there are almost as many definitions of non-performing loans as there are countries in Europe. Um, there are uh, nuances in looking at reporting of, of performing assets and real estate that's been taken back on balance sheet. We publish three separate measures of asset quality for Spanish banks. We have a, a five-page report that tries to compare non-performing loans in Italy versus in Spain. So from an investor standpoint, moving to consistent definitions around non-performing loans, moving to consistent definitions uh, around capital and liquidity. Uh, being in a situation where forbearance is, is not going to be a, a, you know, an uncertain a situation down to each individual national supervisor, uh, I think it is all quite uh, positive. And I also think the ECB, um, I think is, is evidenced by their approach around the, the AQR and this trust test. They are very focused on establishing credibility. They are very focused on establishing um, that they're going to take a prudent conservative approach to supervision. Uh, and uh, in the near term, that actually might not be particularly beneficial for creditors um, because it could result in some banks being uh, moved along that otherwise might be able to muddle through. But I think in the longer term, it'll make it easier for investors to distinguish between risk. And I think uh, ultimately that'll be helpful for the market. I think previous speakers have covered all the relevant points. I have, uh, just one thing that I would add is I think the crisis demonstrated very clearly that the institutional structures for the Eurozone were deficient. And uh, once they made the decision to move towards a banking union, uh, it, was, it was very clear that you know, that would have to be underpinned by a single supervisor given uh, the dangers of capture of national supervisors and also the fact that the quality of nas uh, national supervision uh, varied a great deal. The floor is open. Our co-host. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I would like to compliment all the members of the panel for remarkable presentations. If you allow me a question to both uh, Mike and, uh, and Carolina. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, clearly differentiates the euro area banking system from the US one is the relative importance of banks in terms of financing, right? And incidentally, that's one of the reasons why Europeans seem to be reluctant to kill zombies, right? Because they are big and important and scary looking, right? Now, uh, could we perhaps talk a little about the trends in terms of what we might call deleveraging in the euro area? So this increase in non-banking part of uh, financing that we observe or that we seem to observe, uh, 
And what this implies in terms of regulatory challenges, right? Because that would be, we could characterize this as an increase of what can be in some quarters classified as a shadow banking system on a European scale, right? This, in principle, would be the less or lighter regulated part of uh, financing. And there are, beyond positive, arguably components of financial stability that could be related to that. So. I think we should just go ahead and take this question, and then we can uh, take the answer. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, well, I I think you're uh, right in ob observing that. Um, I mean, there are, there are these um, um, forces that will promote um, funding outside the, the banking system, which I think is probably a positive thing for Europe that to have more sort of diverse sources of funding um, is probably a, a positive development. And then of course, uh, to the extent that um, there's a build up of a shadow banking sector that uh, is uh, sort of below the radar of the, of the uh, supervision, um, that is, of course, uh, a less uh, appealing development, but uh, this is, of course, something that everyone is aware of. So I think monitoring shadow banking has become much more important in Europe now than, than it used to be. And uh, in terms of uh, market funding, I think it is clear everywhere, even in, in Sweden that hasn't really experienced much problems with its banks. I mean, there was this initial problem early on in the crisis uh, connected to their activities in the Baltic states. But even in Sweden, you can really see a pickup in um, market funding by, by um, corporates. I, I think I just add that, you know, we've, we've spent some time thinking on this and we've tried to look at the data that's available and I, it, I'm not sure that anything is definitive, but if you think about alternative sources of funding, you know, one of the most obvious is structured finance. And the structured finance market in Europe has effectively seized up, and it's actually been declining uh, sequentially every year for the last three years. It's at a quite low level, and uh, while, you know, I think there are some laudable efforts underway to try and restart that, that market, there are some pretty significant regulatory barriers in place. Um, and I don't think that those necessarily would be, you know, easy to deal with over the near term. Uh, there, you know, the potential for finance to come from outside of the banking system, and, and there are some indications of that happening. Um, you see that in the in, in the fund sector, where funds are being established um, to invest in assets that typically would have been on bank balance sheets. I, I think at this point, it's still uh, effectively in its infancy, and, and there are a number of characteristics of, of these efforts where they're still partnering with banks either to get their credit expertise, um, to tap into their relationships, or more importantly, to tap in uh, to their balance sheets and funding. Uh, if funding isn't available from structured finance and if funding isn't available from the capital markets. But I, I think the one area where we, we seem to have seen some actual momentum is in uh, bond finance in the corporate sector. And it's been most obvious actually in the peripheral countries um, where there has been a, a, a quite a, a significant uptick in first-time issuers going to the bond markets, and I'm talking about you know non-investment grade issuers. Uh, the average rating has gone down several notches from what it might have, might have been a couple of years ago, but the number of first-time issuers are increasing, uh, and I don't think that's necessarily you know uh, reflects a concern around credit quality. I think it reflects the deepening of the market in, in Europe and corporates being able to and or finding a way to access capital directly from the capital markets and, you know, a supply of fund for lower rated credits than might have been the case in the past. And, uh, and I do think, you know, if you look at the progression of capital markets development in the U.S., that that, that could be a significant trend if, that's, uh, if that persists. I think with the risk of eating a little bit of our lunch break, we have time for our last round of questions. The gentleman there and the gentleman in the back, if you can go to the back mic, please. Uh, 
I'll, I'll make it quick. Uh, my name is Brad Dislin. I'm with uh, Aflac, where I'm global head of credit there. Uh, so naturally, my question uh, for you, Michael, um, seems clear the banks were overrated heading into the crisis. So now we're in this, this catch-up mode. But how would you respond to the thesis that we've overdone it on the ratings front now? And we've rattled off in this panel a lot of the strengths that do exist. We've got better capitalization. We've got uh, better asset quality, dramatic uh, increases in liquidity. The regulatory front is being unified. Um, that all points to a stronger credit picture for most credit investors. Yet we've seen the ratings drop, I think you said, five levels for European banks on average. So could you just maybe address that, please? Thank you. And before you do that, let's, let's take the question in the back, please. Uh, thank you. Helge Berger with the IMF. Um, I thought the banking union was also about, to a large degree, uh, the consensus of, that we need bail-in um, uh, in the future. And, uh, but then, frankly, the panel left me confused. So Carolina said this, uh, the fact that we do have bail-in at the European level is an issue for the Swedish authorities, and I can attest to that. At least the previous government certainly was worried. Then Jay said, uh, well, you know, these regimes differ a lot across countries and, you know, the, the, the subtext seem to be, and therefore it's not that important what has been agreed upon. Maybe I'm, you know, misinterpreting you. And Michael, you were not even discussing it. So, so you know, what, what about Berlin? Well, Michael, if you want to take the first question first and then. Yeah, I, I think on the first question, just in terms of rating level, I, you know, we've spent a a considerable amount of time looking through every data set that we can find in terms of bank failures. Um, uh, and I think at this point we probably have developed the most comprehensive, you know, a data set that's available looking at, you know, crises in the U.S., crises in emerging markets, crises in Europe, and, and focus on the most recent crisis. And um, what's very obvious from that is this is a very cyclical industry. Um, and while bank credit risk hasn't essentially existed historically, in fact, you know, no investor, no bond investor in any major bank in a, in a developed market lost money from, uh, you know, the Great Depression through uh, Lehman Brothers, that's been because of systemic support. But underlying that in terms of banks that needed to be supported uh, or that otherwise would have failed, um, this is actually a very cyclical industry, and, and it really it actually implies standalone ratings kind of in the BA range. Um, our standalone ratings are above that at this point. We're kind of in the, the BAA3 range. Part of that reflects our view that there have been some structural enhancements and changes that are long-lasting that should, over time, reduce the cyclicality of banks or at least reduce their the likelihood of failure given a stronger capital and liquidity. But this has been a cyclical industry. I don't think anything that we've seen is going to change that. Um, and uh, you know, we're trying to reflect that in the ratings appropriately going forward. Carolina Ajay. Balance? Yes, so let me clarify one thing about uh, this. <laughs> so it may be strange that I, I'm now going to clarify the previous government's position regarding bail-in, uh, but I think this is something that uh, there, there isn't so much um, diversity in views within Sweden. I think the Swedish position very much comes from the experience from the Swedish banking crisis in the early 1990s. So I think well, this re really reluctance or this skepticism against bail-in I think comes from um, not from a wish to do bail-out in the sense of letting taxpayers foot the bill for um, the bank's um, you know sometimes reckless behavior I think the 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 sort of consensus view or at least the the, the view held by many in Sweden who were involved in uh, dealing with the crisis in the early 1990s is that um, having the government uh, sort of take over the banks and uh, sort of uh, recapitalize it, um, hold it for some time, run it professionally, just get rid of management uh, and so forth, and of course wipe out all, all the shareholders and then uh, privatize and sell it with a profit for the taxpayers. You know, that would be the Swedish model of dealing with the banking crisis. Um, but it's in, in that type of process, bail-in is um, it's a little bit difficult to see how it fits in. Okay. Uh, just to clarify also what I, I said, I mean, firstly, the bank uh, 
Recovery and Resolution Directive, which covers this issue of bail-in of senior creditors, does not come into effect till 2016. And the fact that it's included in that directive, I think, is a good thing. Now, there's the question of what happens in the interim, given that AQR results are going to be announced now and some banks may go into resolution, so what will happen? What will the regime be? And the point that I made is that I think, I, I, my, my view is that it's unlikely that there will be bail-in of senior creditors in, in these circumstances. Uh, and and uh, one is the financial stability uh, angle, and I think the ECB is going to be concerned about that given the benign market conditions right now, which they're not going to want to, uh, to rock the boat on that. Uh, but also I think there's, there's a danger of different practices in different countries and it'll end up going to the lowest common denominator, which is just, uh, you know, do, uh, just focusing on subordinated debt and, and, uh, and, and uh, hybrid instruments and so on. But I do think there's a broader point of principle. I mean, you know, if there is a contagion risk, and, you know, and I think that that, that, that is, a, that is a, a, a well taken point, I think it is unfair to put the burden on the taxpayer of an individual country in those circumstances. They're doing something for the common good, uh, uh, preventing contagion, and I think there needs to be some compensation for that, ideally through a common backstop. I'll be very brief. Um, and I'll just say, I guess, that you know, if you were a sub-debt holder in Co-op Bank or SNS or Besh or any number of Spanish banks, you know that uh, Balin is here. It's a reality. Um, uh, it would have been unthinkable perhaps five years ago to bail in even sub-debt holders out of concerns around market impact. And the market has survived any number of instances where sub-debt holders have been bailed in. Um, I think, you know, resolution is difficult to do. It's going to be even more difficult for very large cross-border firms, but if they need to be recapitalized, um, there's going to be a, you know, a, a desire to think about where those funds come from. So without, you know, making a judgment on whether that's the right or the wrong thing, um, I think with the framework that's put in place, there's a, a much greater likelihood going forward that there's going to be bail on not just of sub-debt, which has become, you know, an accepted expectation, uh, but of senior unsecured debt as well, and, and as you know, folks in Cyprus found out, potentially deposits, uninsured deposits. Well, on that note, uh, given what the time is, I would like to thank you, the panel, very much for elaborating and illuminating what, a very, what is a very complex area. And um, <coughs> we are ready, I believe, for lunch. And take over, Adam. Oh, th thank you to Jacob, to Carolina, to Michael, to Jay. I mean... Uh, there's a lot of other stuff going on this week, but I think everyone, and right now, but I think everyone will agree who stayed here for this, the substantive quality of this panel was simply outstanding. And I'm truly grateful to our three participants and my dear colleague and chair for achieving that result. And I look forward to promoting the video and the presentations from this panel throughout the website and throughout our world, because I think it was great discussion. But yes, it is my pleasure to invite you to be fed. Lunch is now. And in about 15 minutes, we'll start again with Vitor Gaspar. Thank you.